Anyway, I want to introduce Sheila and son Coleman. Sheila Hipple lives in Brady, Texas, a really great area of Texas. Son Coleman, right here. Like the beautiful. And uh, and the daughter Christian, and they own Help Yourself Well to Shop. One of the main reasons for opening the shop was to provide access to the beneficial electromagnetic field. Eh, sorry, beneficial electric. And I do this professionally. Okay. Uh, was to provide access to the beneficial electromagnetic frequency EMF device called a Beamer. Beamer. Okay, like the car. This device was developed by the Institute of Microcircularization in Berlin, Germany, with the specific purpose to increase circulation. IM utilizes advanced microscopic technology to, to observe the beneficial impact EMF has on the human body. Six years of specialized, specialized training on the beneficial effects of EMF gave her the scientific background and insight to understand the hazardous effects of chaotic EMF that come from various wireless devices that emit radio and microwave frequencies such as those used by smart meters. She has spent the past two years extensively researching the EMF issue and has direct contact with many of the authors of scientific research substantiating the hazardous effects of smart meters and EMF exposure. Sheila and her son Coleman have testified before the Texas Senate Business and Commerce Committee and Public Utility Commission hearings regarding the potential health issues related to smart meters. Their efforts were picked up by the Texas Tribune and New York Times. Sheila and Coleman have been guest speakers on news media, numerous radio and interviews, internet interviews, and at various political group meetings around the state. They were able to testify before the Texas Republican Convention Platform Committees and the platform now states that the Texas Republican Party opposes the mandated use of smart meters as well as the use of collected data to reduce freedoms of U.S. citizens. And you know what? Thank you. Thank you. We're on. We on? We're good. Nope. 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 No. Nope. 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 <laughs> now we're on. Uh, yes, it is a pleasure to be with you this evening, and I thank uh, the True North for inviting us. It is such a delight to see such interest of the community. And from what we're hearing about the buzz and chatter happening in San Antonio, Texas, I think a lot of people are coming to the understanding of what, it is, what is at stake with the deployment of this technology. Uh, this is my son, Coleman Hemphill, and uh, I want to thank him because I couldn't do what I do if it weren't for him. Uh, I'll be doing predominantly most of the talk this evening. I just want to give you a little heads up. You're going to be receiving a lot of information. I wouldn't even try to absorb it all and try to think you're supposed to memorize it all because, you know, just sit back, enjoy it. Uh, if anyone would like a copy of the presentation, uh, my contact information is available at the websites of Coalition for Safe, uh, for Smart, Safe Meters org and Smart Meter, San Antonio Smart Meter Awareness org. And I'll be putting those websites up here in a moment. What we have for you is we would like to start with a small video it pretty much sums up and gives you a good overview. Can I see a hand, a show of hands here of individuals who may be with the city? Do uh, we have any city representatives? Okay. Any CPS? I was hoping they would come. I really was. I would love for them to uh, understand our concerns and the information that you're going to have when you leave here. Now then. Uh, so we'll have just a few minutes on this video. Under my plan uh, of a cap and trade system, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. So this is a smart meter bank. It's inside a Northwest DC condominium building and there's 32 different smart meters. So what I did was I brought in a meter that measures the levels of radio frequency radiation and these smart meters are emitting radiation every few seconds. 
definition of a smart grid is a wireless system that will fundamentally turn every single appliance in your home into the equivalent of a transmitting cell phone. Every single appliance that you have in your house will eventually, in a smart grid, have an antenna that's embedded into it that will transmit your usage data to a smart meter on the outside of your home that will then go to the utility company for supposedly billing purposes. They're being found in pilot programs now, smart grids are, to really save no energy whatsoever. What you're seeing is the establishment of a sur of surveillance society. You're, you're seeing the establishment of a surveillance network. It raises the specter of you're automatically suspicious until we prove that you're not. It raises the specter of a universal, I call it a universal wiretap, a persistent universal wiretap on every single person. Or if it not, they can create one. Because then what happens if they don't like you? What happens if you speak ill will against the government? What happens if you say something that you consider disloyal? I mean, that's not the country that, that I took an oath to defend four times in my government career. It's a technology done by private companies, these electric companies, private companies that have the right to install this on your house, destroy your health, and there's no accountability at the moment. This whole smart meter fiasco could go away very quickly if these alternative energy technologies were simply allowed to flourish. Now, that's not going to be in the agenda of the controlling elite. That's going to be up to us. These companies are betting on you saying nothing. They're betting on you quietly complying with their wishes to install these smart meters on your property. You have the right to refuse a smart meter. This snippet of videos was taken from Take Back Your Power. So could I see a show of hands of who have been able to see that documentary yet? Okay, and I believe we have a um, party gift for this evening of, of getting a, a video of that. So make sure you keep your tickets. And we've got a really pretty poinsettia. So um, from now, I'd like to go ahead and begin the presentation. Here we go. Now these are in shoe departments from 19, 
uh, 20 to about 1970. So, you know, the government doesn't always move real swiftly to protect you from hazardous technology. I believe we kind of knew that x-rays were not good for us before 1970, but they were still in deployment. Good idea. Solved the problem. The only problem was the ionizing radiation from x-rays causes cancer. So what else can we learn when we look back through history? How about asbestos? Great insulator, fire retardant, solves a lot of problems. Except when we found out the truth that it was responsible for mesothelioma and various different lung diseases and illnesses, we stopped it. Now what's interesting about asbestos, it went all the way back to Roman times. And basically it was phased out in about 1990. So we didn't get a real big hurry on that one either. How about DDT? Great pesticide. I mean, a claims about how it can help wipe out malaria, and it did. It did a great job. The only problem was it too caused cancers. And what was interesting, but I really think what got DDT was the fact that they were showing that the eggs of bald eagles were being softened, and the eggs, the bald eagles is in jeopardy of extension of a, of a species. So I believe that's what kind of got DDT evolved out in 1972. Wireless communications, they're convenient, they're low cost, and you get real time data. Many people are addicted to it. All you have to do is watch a, a sit around a dinner table anymore and everybody is pretty much on their sailor and, and cordless. But oh, see, guilty, guilty, okay. Right here amongst us. Now, question is, remember that DDT and how it softened those eggs and those bald eagles? And that's what kind of got DDT discontinued? Well, what are we seeing coming from the American Academy of Environmental Medicine regarding the impact of electromagnetic frequencies on the genetic genotoxic effects from RF frequency, including studies of non-thermal levels of exposure consistently and specifically show chromosomal instability, altered gene expression, gene mutation, DNA fragmentation, and DNA structure breaks. <coughs> doesn't sound too good for the genes and the chromosomes. Now let me think, now where are genes and chromosomes in our bodies? Well, I believe that would be in the gonads. So when you see that RF frequencies of a laptop in a male's lap after four hours reduces the sperm count of that male, and when you see the research that talks about what they can see with chicken eggs, that they expose to RF frequency and they come out mutated. Every egg of a female is in that baby when it's born, in those ovaries. These children, as you saw in that diagram, start out exposed to radio frequencies from baby monitors, Wi-Fi, cell phones, routers, smart meters, three feet from the crib in some instances. So what does asbestos, DDT, and radio frequencies have in common? They have been categorized by the World Health Organization of the International Agency for Research on Cancer as a group 2B possible carcinogenic for humans. Asbestos, DDT, and radio frequencies from wireless communications, mobile phones, cordless home phones, baby monitors, Wi-Fi, cordless printers, smart meters. Now, how much asbestos do we have going into our public school system right now being built? It was a great product. None. How many building codes? allow for asbestos in their community? None. In fact, it's very expensive to have an asbestos abatement. How 
much DDP is being utilized in our agriculture? Class? Zero. Zero. And yet, here we have radio frequencies in the same class and category as an entire list of possible carcinogenic to human and we are having reckless deployment in it in all of our schools, our hospitals, our public building. And this isn't just in the United States. European countries have had this infrastructure longer than we have, about 10 or 15 years. And so consequently, what we are seeing are communities, one in particular in France was touting how they were the first Wi-Fi community. Guess what? They're backing out of it. They're going fiber optics. So what we have here is reckless deployment of technology because it's convenient, low cost, and you get real data. Well, I will say that the greatest cost to a nation is poor health of its people. There's nothing more costly than for our nation to be sick. And it doesn't take just a whole lot of research to go look at the stats of infant death, mortality, cancer rates, heart disease, diabetes. Now, am I saying it's all about radio frequencies? No. But I'm saying when you start researching the issue, there is thousands of scientific, medically reviewed documentation that shows connectivity to many of these illnesses plaguing our nation today. Now, this is an example taken from Take Back Your Power, and this is called uh, Dark Field Microscopy, Analyzing Blood Cells. And a lot of uh, different types of uh, naturopathic doctors or different entities might provide this. So you take a bit of your blood on a slide and you watch it. And in real time, you can actually see the blood cells moving around. Uh, this is what normal function blood cells should look like. Floaty little round balls floating around. That's what's carrying your oxygenation to your tissues. <clears throat> this is the same blood from the same individual, three minutes, well one is two minutes, two minutes from sitting next to a smart meter at a distance of one foot. In two minutes, this is the kind of degradation you have in the cellular wall function of blood cells. If blood doesn't get to tissue, you have dying tissue. <coughs> you have oxygen, it's not getting nutrition, and it's not carrying away toxins. So what kind of symptoms have been associated by individuals who have what is called electromagnetic hypersensitivity? Now, not everyone is currently symptomatic, but because everyone is living tissue, and everyone is a living organism, you are an electrical being. <laughs> You go to the doctor, and when someone dies, they have been monitoring their EEG or their brain waves. And you see that chart, because we're producing electricity from our brain. We're producing electricity from our heart, and that's what you get with an EKG. Every cell in our body has a set, a electrical function. It has little gates called voltage-gated calcium channels, which we'll go over here in a moment. Here are some symptoms. Usually the ones, one of the first ones that starts is with sleeping problems. Sleep. Now, it is possibly one of the largest complaints in the medical industry is insomnia and sleeping problems. Once you disrupt that circadian rhythm, that can start being the downfall of all sorts of different types of illnesses. Your restorative uh, function of your body occurs at night, so that's when you really need to have your good sleep. Sleeping problems. Stress, agitation, anxiety, and irritability. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I think we can kind of all kind of see that one. Headaches, sharp pain and pressure in the head. Ringing of the ears. Ringing of the ears, high pitch. Concentration, memory, learning problems. Fatigue, muscle and physical weakness. Disorientation, dizziness, and balance problems. Eye problems, eye pain, cardiac symptoms, heart palpitations, heart arrhythmias, chest pain, leg cramps, neuropathy, arthritis, body pain, nausea. Y'all can read these. There are many. Now, according to Dr. Magda Havis at Trent University, she is saying that a large, a portion of society is already electromagnetic hypersensitivity, meaning 
they are already exhibiting these symptoms. The problem comes in is when you start exhibiting these symptoms like elevated blood sugar, that would be known as diabetes. Uh, there's documentation about how these frequencies impact blood sugar levels. So when you start exhibiting these symptoms, what do people do? Go to the doctor. The doctors are not receiving education about the hazards of electromagnetic frequencies. Now, am I saying all these symptoms, anybody has a symptom is this? No, I'm not. But the problem is, is if your exposure and you're sensitive to these frequencies and the doctor doesn't know to even let you know about them, you're not changing your environment. Because there are things we can do to try to minimize our exposure and protect our family with um, there are devices that you can use to help remove electromagnetic fields, and we'll get to that. This is an example of a high school ninth grade class. Remember when you were in first grade, everybody had the little paper towel with the seeds in it, and you watered it, and you watched it, 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 it germinate. Well, this was just a, side, a high school science project, and as you see, the plate on top that was not exposed to Wi-Fi exposure germinated. The plate that was exposed to Wi-Fi did not germinate with the same environment, water, light, etc. Now that was just a high school experiment. But what was interesting after they did it, several different researchers picked up and were doing their own. So I just wanted to hit on those particular points while we're at the beginning of this meeting because I'm going to try to hit about a 10 after uh, presentation stop so we have time for questions and after we get through with questions we can talk about different types of uh, uh, demonstrations if time permitting and what y'all's desire is so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to kind of give you an overview of what's going on with smart meters the supply of your electricity begins at your energy power plants now I don't know how many of you have been watching what's happening regarding coal powered power plants and how many of them are being decommissioned. I don't know how many of you were watching the issues going on with Fukushima, which was a nuclear plant in Japan. So as that electricity is being delivered to you, all we have to do is look over at California and we can see that there have been some issues between the supply of electricity from the supplier and to the end consumer. So I'm going to ask Coleman to kind of talk just briefly about a little company you may have heard of called Enron. <laughs> so I had the, the great opportunity this summer to go to Washington, D.C., and then also at the state convention, and, and talking to people like Ted Cruz and to our, Ryan Sitton, our new railroad commissioner. And one of my major concerns is after doing some research, on this, I saw a lot of connectivity between what happened in California with Enron and what we're seeing here in Texas. So Enron was the seventh largest corporate bankruptcy in United States history. And a lot of that stemmed from the supply of electricity that owned both the supplier as well as the infrastructure to deliver it to their consumers. In many cases, they created artificial uh, lack of supply and drove up the energy rates in those areas. What we've seen recently this last year is the bankruptcy of Energy Future Holdings, which is the parent company of both TXU as well as Encore. Now this was a, they're 40 million or 40 billion dollars, excuse me, with a B, dollar, dollars in debt. What happened in California is when these utility companies mismanaged their their services so poorly, all of that debt then goes to the state. And that's what my big concern is. And with these smart meters, and we'll have a slide to, to look at this here in a bit, the only way that this becomes profitable, the only way that the $290 million investment in San Antonio becomes profitable is if they can charge you for time of use billing. This gives them an excuse basically to charge you higher rates throughout the day rather than the set rates that we have right now. The, the utility company, and if you think about it, are not going to put out that investment strictly for your benefit. They're going to make profit off of this. 
So now, once the electricity gets to your utility pole, and you see that transformer up there, you will see for overhead supply, you're going to see a line that comes into your home in a weather head that comes down into a meter box. All of that is property of the homeowner. The only thing on that is uh, the meter belongs to the utility company. Now, the meters that you used to have were analog meters, and we'll discuss the difference between analog and digital here in a moment. But now, instead of a meter reader coming to look at that analog that has a wheel on it, they, that information is now being transmitted wirelessly through cellular towers to the utility company. So this is emitting radio frequencies uh, to the cellular tower. Your home electrical, electrical system is designed for a 60 hertz delivery. That's 60 waves per second. All your appliances are coded for that. Because the smart meters are delivering communications at 900 megahertz, 900 million waves per second, connected directly in connection to your electrical system, it creates static in the line. That static creates electromagnetic frequencies, fields, that is from the wall. So basically your home can become filled with electric smog. This is known as dirty electricity. Now, as it talked about in the video, they're coming out with smart appliances. A smart appliance has what is called, um, communicates through with the meter with what is known as a Zigbee chip. That Zigbee chip communicates at 2.4 gigahertz, which is 2.4 billion waves per second, which is what your Wi-Fi operates. So very similar to how you would print from your computer to a wireless printer, the smart meters will be able to communicate with your smart dishwasher, your smart washing machine, your smart thermostat, and have the ability, even though they say, oh, we'll never do that, uh, you should have heard some of the testimonies of people from foreign countries about, yeah, they told us that too. Especially in what country was that? At, at the Texas Senate, we heard from one person who grew up in Romania. And she was saying that in that country, the utilities came in and put controls on all of their boxes under the exact same guise that they're selling to us now. That this was going to help them re better regulate the grid and save that person money. Now oh. they then use that, of course, as they use that as a way to control people in that population. We heard a very similar testimony from a doctor from Cuba who said, again, they came in with the exact same guys to save money, but there again, they didn't deliver on their promise. So now then, your home is now emitting to the smart meter. And sometimes, these wireless devices like your cordless home phone, they're always on. They're possibly one of the most egregious uh, systems in your home. This is called an acoustometer, and it's picking, picking up radio frequencies in our room. It is, ping, it is uh, bouncing back and forth here from one voltmeter, and if I move it closer to a cordless home phone, we're getting six, a wireless router, Wi-Fi, six volts per meter. These, uh, anything over 2.5 and above is 50 times what most scientists regard as safe. Now on the back here it says above 0.5 volts per meter, nearly all electrosensitivity individuals report adverse health effects. Now <clears throat> what's happening regarding the reporting of adverse health effects, which we have here in the diagram in the guy in bed, it's disrupting your sleep cycle. Um, these frequencies uh, disrupt your pineal, cause you to hesitate your speech in the middle. <laughs> I got too close to the meter. Uh, your pineal, you have a pineal gland here that is designed to detect darkness so that when you get into total darkness, your body should go, oh, it's dark. Sun's down, dark, release melatonin, sleep sound, sleep like a baby. The problem is, that your pineal gland can't really tell the difference between light frequencies and the frequencies of all these wireless devices around you. 
So to your body, you're in a chronic state of alert and you're not releasing melatonin. So there are thousands of reports that show a direct correlation to reduced melatonin and cancers. Now, would y'all like to breathe? Here we go, come on. Everybody has some air. Let's get a little, I know it's above much, but it's very important that we cover some of these issues with you. So now we're going to go on to unwarranted surveillance, security issues, cost factors, property damage, safety risk, and health risks. We're gonna go through these pretty quickly because as I said, I wanna make sure and leave some time for y'all to answer questions. So what is a smart meter? And what's the difference between an analog meter and a smart meter? Well, the meter on the left is an analog meter. It has a wheel, it has the little gears, and that's uh, a little display. It's very mechanical, very simplistic, very mechanical. Not much to go wrong with a smart meter. Analog. Analog, yes, thank you. And an not much to go wrong with the analog meter. Now, a smart meter, on the other hand, is basically a computer controlling device on the side of your home with a motherboard and antennas and transmitting devices. Making any kind of electrical uh, device is susceptible to environmental issues, rain, cold, etc. So the smart meter utilizes digital, this is important, digital two-way communication to transmit utility usage of water, gas, and electrical to the utility company. The smart meters can also be used for remote disconnects, and that's one of the perks that CPS will tell you that they're able to do, which is true. They can do remote disconnects. They don't have to send someone out. Now, I found this very interesting. On the left is an example of an ad analog signal. You notice how uniform and continuous that is. That is the transmission that we would have from the old AM, FM. Remember the um, rabbit ears on your television? Do you remember the big push? You know, get your uh, converter to digital. Remember all that? It actually stems with how the signals are transmitted. The analog is a continuous continuity of waveform, which means your body can somewhat acclimate to something of consistency. It's like going to sleep with your fan. You hear the same hum. Digital transmits data in bursts, and then it goes dormant, burst, pulses. So it's a very different signal that is being delivered through the system. So I came here and I tested um, an individual's home here in San Antonio for dirty electricity and she only had a digital meter. But her readings were like 1900 and it should be under 50. I'm like, okay, what's the deal going on? Well, the digital meters may not be transmitting with radio frequency, but they still communicate in a pulse delivery system. Now, so what are we hearing from CPS? Actually, it's not very original because it's kind of what you hear from every utility company. They all have pretty much the same talking points. Have you heard the one that you get less RF exposure from a cell phone than you do a smart meter? How many here have heard that one? Less, I mean less from a smart meter. What did I say? Yeah. I did bad word? Yeah. Okay, let's try that again. That you get less RF from a cell phone then you do a smart meter. No. 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 Really? <laughs> Less from a smart meter. Less from a smart meter than a cell phone. Well, what's 1%? Huh? Well, what's 1% difference? What's 1%? Well, here's what's interesting. They all reference the same report. And that comes from the California Council on uh, Science and Technology, CCST. Good question. Who are they? I am so glad. Did I did I prime you to see that? That's exactly what I need. Hmm. CCST. Well, anybody have, has anybody seen this chart out there that shows how much you get from your cell phone? That's usually part of the package of assuring you that there's no problem for smart meters. Because look, you get so much more for your cell phone. Like that's a good thing. No, no. But here is the the document being propagated by utility companies. This comes from the CCST report. Now what's interesting is these PUCs will finally start having some hearings as people start complaining. Get enough people complaining, finally they have hearings on it. And they go, well we're gonna call for a report on it. And they do a report, and they hire people to provide the report. They deliver the report, 
as if it is the gospel truth. It's accepted. There's no rebuttal. There's no peer review. There's no refining of is that information true and accurate until it's delivered by the authority and it's gospel truth that there's no problem with RF and there's you get more from your cell phone than you do the smart meter. So rest assured. The problem is when it's delivered and it goes through peer-reviewed scientists with all the credentials and all the knowledge, guess what? A lot of the information isn't accurate. So what we have here is a review from a Daniel Hirsch who is a um, professor of nuclear physics, I believe, at the University of Southern California. And what's interesting is he said that the CCST, remember the Council on uh, Science and Technology, basically went to an eight-page pamphlet produced by the Electrical Power Research Institute and did a cut and paste from that for their report to produce to the CP, uh, PUC. I think there's a term called conflict of interest there. Now, then as he looked more into the CCST report, he found that when they made this chart showing the cell phone, what they did was they took the measurements of the antenna next to the head and took that measurement, which is why it's so high. They did not take this measurement and give it to whole body exposure, which is how they measured the smart meter of whole body exposure. So when you correct that little apples and error measurement problem, you get the chart on the right, which shows that smart meters have 40 times more exposure than what you get from a cell phone. Now that is not to be assumed that any of it's really safe, even according to the FCC. You will not find documentation from talking about the safety, and we'll get to that in a moment. Now, uh, this example is a diagram from Encore, who utilizes what is called mesh networking. Uh, this diagram I thought was more uh, descriptive, but it's a similar technology utilized by Silver Spring Network, who is used by CPS Energy. Now what that does, is I call it daisy chain. You know, I am not a techie person. In fact, I try real hard not to have any personal opinion or words. I always try to reference someone else. But these are my words right now. And I don't know if you know what a daisy chain is. It is where the meters speak to another meter. So what happens, and I found research on this, is when these utilities use unlicensed frequencies, they are restricted to one watt of transmission per pulse per transmission, which means they can't go real far so you start looking at your skyline and you will see all these antennas showing up on everything. That's because we have just tripled the amount of um, transmitters and receivers that need to be serviced when you deploy smart meters. I had a gentleman in, uh, with Encore in Dallas. He'd been out of town, came home. That night he started having massive heart palpitations. Had no idea that a smart meter had been installed had, had no concept. Someone told him about the smart meter, he got Encore out there, and sure enough, his home was the hot spot. He had seven different homes transmitting to his home that then transmitted up to the collector site. So this is what you can get with the mesh system. So what is happening with CPS? What are they saying? They are saying transmits burst, of radiation, uh, actually this is, a, oh, it missed the signal every four hours. So that would simply be six times a day. How many has heard that one? That it only transmits six times a day? And maybe for less than a minute. I'm not sure what they're saying. You know, less than a minute. Well, these are microbursts. How long does it take you to figure out you stuck your finger in an electrical socket? A microburst which is detrimental to your body. So just because they're microbursts in a short amount of time is not a consolation prize. Now, what's interesting is when you start really checking them out that was done by Josh, uh, well, let me back up. PG&E out of California was an energy company that also used the mesh network by Silver Spring Network. When they were sitting there making the statement that it's only six times a day, it's only for a few, you know, less than a minute of transmission, when people were having their meters out there, they were getting a pulsation on that. And I believe Josh Hart was talking about uh, six times every two minutes here in San Antonio. 
He has a video on that. Under oath, when they got PG&E into court, they had to confess that actually those little communications between the different meters in that mesh network between homes was more like 190,000 times per day. I could sit there and drop 190,000 drops of water on you in a day, and it would probably get uncomfortable after a while, even with a drop of water. I think they called that water torture. I just made that up. That was me. That was not a river. <laughs> I would encourage you to uh, go to stopswampreader.org and look at the video by Josh Hart. And this was actually took place with the smart meters here in San Antonio. Now, I love how they cherry pick various different reports. So here we have them talking about you get more exposure from your cell phone than you a smart meter, right? Banners across the state, handouts everywhere. But you know what else was in that CCST report is they're saying that consumers should be provided with clearly understood information about the radio frequency emission of all devices that emit RF, including smart meters. Such information could, should include intensity of output, duration and frequency of output, and in cases of a smart meter, pattern of sending and receiving transmissions to and from all sources. How many here has gotten their proposal of what your emission schedule is going to be? And how many homes might be transmitted to your house? Has anyone received or even been told that they might be receiving that from CPS? I kind of doubt it. Because everyone I've talked to, none of them get that bit of the CCST report. So they cherry pick what it is they want to hear. Now, um, this topic is being held today with True North, which is a branch of the San Antonio Tea Party. And I want to thank Sandy. And there were several different other individuals here that we wanted to bring up. So if you know who you are, John, y'all come on up. Who else? If you're informed, I have a list here. What we want to take a break, a, a little short break here, and disclose is that this is not a political issue. Come on up. Partisan, Partisan issue. This issue affects every human you and future generations. It affects our environment. It affects, um, give me the list for Sandy, please. It affects animals. In fact, in February of this year, there was a letter from the Department of Interior to the FCC talking about how these radio frequencies are disturbing the migratory paths of birds and in impacting their um, population and other wildlife. How many of you have heard about the uh, bee colony collapse? Bee colony collapse. Now, I'm not saying that this is, y'all come on over, that this is um, solely due to our frequencies. But we have a few here, and there were others. I don't know if they've shown up, but I just want to mention a few names and a few entities and appreciate their involvement. We have Sandy, come on up. Matanya. Yes, Sandy Macheka with True North. We have Nikki Coons with the Coalition for Safe Meters. I, I believe she was ill tonight. Uh, John Joseph is a member of the Democratic Party. Bobby Mueller. Bobby, where are you, Bobby? Come here, Bobby. Come on. We have our Republican <laughs> member. Did Henry Rodriguez and George Alejos? They're with LULAC. They were invited and had intentions of attending this evening. We have Marilyn Murray. Marilyn? Not sure. Uh, with the Houston, uh, not Houston, San Antonio, Homeowner Taxpayer Association of Bear County. Y'all come over this way. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. And we have Dr. Uh, Dagny Marie. And also, we've also invited Gracie Sanchez with Esperanza Center, Antonio Diaz with Texas in Indigenous Council, and we also had an invitation to the Sierra Club. So if you know anyone in these entities, we want involvement and education to everyone. This is not a political party issue. 
this is about the quality of life that you will have here in San Antonio, Texas. And it's going to be dependent on your involvement on what we can do about it here in San Antonio. And there are things we can do. So I want to thank you all so much. For being here. Okay, we're going to go on to what is referred to as unwarranted surveillance. This is a Fourth Amendment issue that you have the right to be secure in your home and not subject to unwarranted surveillance. And if someone wants to come into your home, they have to receive a warrant from a judge. The smart meters are computer controller that keeps a date and time stamp log of the activities of your water, electric, and gas usage. Each electrical appliance in your home can create a unique pattern. This coupled with an activity log can serve as an unwarranted surveillance. Now, you'll hear from them that, oh, we don't do that. And they may not. They may not look at it, but what's interesting, when you do a little research, funny how Google had what they called a power meter, and from Google's information, it says, huh, I see here that you had your dryer on, then your fridge came on, then your web server, and your outdoor lights, and your TV, and your heater. So now, this is not from a smart chip. This is not a smart appliance. This is about the unique a uh, pattern of electricity usage based upon their activity log, almost like looking at your heartbeat. Now, are they using it? I don't know. Do they have that kind of information? I don't know. It's an activity log. Google is awful proud that they uh, were pleased that the power meter helped demonstrate the importance of access to energy information and created the model for others. We retired the service in September 16th of 2011. How come? Because now all the utilities are doing it. So I have strong reason to believe that the capacity to track your activity usage based upon the unique signal print of your utility usage exists. Do I know CPS use it? No, I don't. But I kind of have a hang for it. It might be up there. Now then, here could be a typical scenario based upon that signature you saw. I see you awoke, your alarm clock went off at 6.15, the uh, coffee maker went on at 6.20, and you stepped in the shower, because remember you have a water heater too, we can see when your water is used. And then at 6.25, your hot water heater kicks on, because remember, we're monitoring your gas. And it took, you took a 14 minute shower, and then you blew your hair dry for six minutes. Now, this is Sheila, I have no basis for what I'm about to say. I kind of have a feeling that if you know when I'm using my shower, and you know how it, my water, how hard would it be for your computer system to communicate with my water and say, excuse me, that you have exceeded your 10 minute UN shower limits and you shower is off. Now that's strictly an uneducated, unsubstantiated statement. Now with the Zigbee control chips, now we're going to have a little more control because that smart meter will have the capacity to say, uh, I'm sorry. You cannot use your washing machine from 2 to 4 today. Sorry, you should have thought of that. But you know what? We'll take care of it. Go ahead and stick the clothes in the washer and stick the wet ones in the dryer and we'll turn that on for you because it's convenient at 2 in the morning so that you get the lower peak usage. And we're going to save you some money. <coughs> Vulnerability hacking. Any wireless communication is subject to hacking. And they'll tell you it's encrypted and all the jargon. It's true, but you know, there's people out there that make their whole purpose in life to hack wireless communications. And they're pretty good at it. In fact, there was a uh, meeting recently of the Black Hatters, which is a group of uh, hackers and security experts, and their whole purpose in life is trying to hack into systems. And they were successful in it. What they're able to do if they hack into it is they can basically adjust your readings up or down. Because <coughs> remember, it's not mechanical. It's digital. Remotely shut off your power. Uh, remotely look into your security cameras, your cell phones, anything wireless they have access to. And uh, basically, it can serve as a backdoor into the utility supply uh, power company itself and cause all sorts of havocs with the equipment in that uh, energy supply company. <clears throat> and they'll tell you they're encrypted and they can't do that. And maybe they can't. I hope not. I hope that can be. However, it doesn't, you know, I don't know if you heard kind of what happened to uh, Iran's nuclear plant. I think they got a bug and 
I think things kind of overheated. Okay, in Spain, they were actually able to hack into the, uh, the power supplies by reverse engineering, taking the meters, reverse engineering it, and getting in the back door into the power supply. And they were able to, uh, basically, they stated that with this back door access, they would be able to harm the overall national power network. Now, <clears throat> reducing cost, right? Right. right. Let's see here. We have an analog meter that's really simple in function. A lot of metal in it, no computer chips, nothing. They have anywhere from a 25 to 30 year service life. At the best I've seen on the smart meters is touting a 15 year service life. In our community, we took out perfectly good analogs that were supposed to have a 25 year service life and we'd only had them 10 years. And that's supposed to be good cost savings. I don't get that. Now, go talk to Austin, Texas, and they were really excited about the $60 million that were needed to upgrade the software to run the advanced meter infrastructure system. After it's fully installed. After it's fully installed. I'm thinking that $60 million would pay for a whole lot of meter readers. And those would be people who have salaries that go out and spend in your shops and enhance an economy rather than simply being profit margins for dividends to stockholders of energy companies. Just my opinion. Where's the cost benefit? Where's the cost benefit on that? Hmm. Where is the cost benefit analysis? This came from Ontario. This was really new. This was December 9th, just a few days ago. Wasn't this interesting? They were told their smart meter deployment was going to cost $1 million. And oops, it ended up costing $1.9 billion. So just the deployment of it doubled than what they had been told. Then when they started looking into it, they asked, where's the cost benefit analysis that would have warranted this project? There was none. Then they go, well, you know, you told us that we were supposed to be saving 600 million. We were going to save 600 million. Oops, they missed that by about 512 million in savings. And we're seeing this everywhere. In fact, there was a blip over in, I believe it's Maine. I think it was Maine. Uh, they were supposed to save like, uh, I don't know, you know the numbers kind of all start billions, millions, billions. They had issues and they called for a public hearing there in Maine as well. It is not difficult for you to do a Google and do smart meter Oklahoma, smart meter Maryland, uh, stop smart meters, let's see, stop smart meters Oklahoma, stop smart meters Florida, stop smart meters, as you saw on the map early in the video, movements against this are nationwide as well as worldwide. In our community of Brady, when I found out this was happening, I too asked, where is the cost benefit analysis? I mean, shouldn't something substantiate why we're about to be indebted $2.5 million when our whole budget is $20 million? So we're about to do something that's 10% of our budget. Where's the cost benefit analysis? There wasn't one. Okay, I was like, all right, where are the reports from the employees out there in the field talking about how horrible these uh, analogs are? There was none. There was absolutely zero documentation from the city that warranted that deployment. Okay, now what are some of, are y'all tired? You don't need to, really, feel free to kind of stand up and breathe. Yeah, if anyone needs to go to the restroom, it's kind of heavy. I don't really enjoy this aspect of my task of sharing with these very difficult and complex issues, but they're too important for people not to know. So I appreciate you holding in here um, on this information. There have been three attorney generals who have rejected uh, smart meters, saying there's no evidence of billions of dollars in benefits. How dumb do they think we are? Pretty dumb. Pretty dumb. Now, this is interesting. In 2012, Encore, who is the utility provider for up around Dallas and North Texas, they paid out, they paid 51 executives $81 million in bonuses. That was in 2012. And then, I believe that was in the spring, they came up and talked about, oh, their parent company was going through bankruptcy and Encore was going to need to come up with $100 million. I'm like, shouldn't have thought about that before you paid out bonuses? 
of 81 million to 51 executives. So this is what we're seeing happening in these private energy companies. Uh, anybody here are familiar with the term public-private partnerships? Known as P3s. What happens is, it's a sweet deal. We, the taxpayers, get hung out paying for the infrastructure the utility lines and all the infrastructure needed to move energy. And then the private companies come in and provide the services on the infrastructure that we as taxpayers shelled at. And if they go broke, then the taxpayers pay them. If they go broke, then it becomes the debt of the state on the taxpayers again. And they get all the profit. Now, this is what Coleman had visited about um, the, the, the golden the golden ring on all this is to get into time of use pricing. That is where, because they are having constant communication with these meters, they know what time of day you're able to use your utilities. So what happens is, when there's a peak load, like when people are doing business, or uh, they have the greatest need, that is the greatest need of supply. That is when prices go up. So basically, with time of use, it penalizes the person who's on a fixed income. They don't have any extra, they're using the same amount of electricity they have all the time, but now they're getting charged more from their time frames and from seven in the morning to 11 and from five to seven. Well, if you're a business, how many businesses here just randomly use electricity because you like to pay a utility bill? You don't do that. You use the amount of electricity necessary for you to do business. <coughs> So what happens is it's the individuals who are on a fixed income, the elderly, the people who are the lowest income who are hit the worst, because business is going to transfer that cost onto you, the consumer. National threat. Now, this is a really interesting one. So we have spent billions of dollars of stimulus money on this smart meter grid and smart grid. But the problem is, there has not been any activity to secure the supply of electricity at the source from electromagnetic pulses. Now, electromagnetic pulses can come in the form of an atmospheric nuclear bomb. So we listened to a security expert, Michael Del Rosa, this time last year in Dallas, and he came and said, look, we know that North Korea is circling a satellite north to south over the United States. The problem with that is that we have our only watching for missiles, missile alert systems, are on the east coast and west coast. So there's not really anything watching for missiles coming from south to north, north to south, where Korea is, North Korea is circling it. And he said, if I'm a terrorist and I get a hold of an atomic bomb, why would I want to waste it on one urban area? When for $100,000, I can go get my own missile launcher, go to the Gulf of Mexico, throw the atomic bomb 20 miles up in the air over Ohio, and knock out two-thirds of electricity in the United States. And when I mean knock out, with the electromagnetic pulse, the um, intensity of the current is so strong that you've seen a motherboard that had those little solder points. It's as if you're arcing over those solder points, and it burns out anything that has electronic motherboard in it. And what's disturbing is when you know how much of the electrical power companies have this type of electronic technology, then if you go to try to order another transformer at these huge stations, it takes two years to build one, and they're built in China. Now there is technology that can be utilized to secure uh, these, these um, transformer stations. So now, not only do we have to worry about a terrorist attack of an atomic bomb, but also electromagnetic pulses can come from solar flares. In fact, there was a significant one in 1859 that it was so strong that it literally caught the telegraph wires on fire and caused fires in telegraph offices. Barbed wires caught fire. So anything electrical that has a long uh, run on it would heat up with such degree. One 1859, it knocked out the telegraph stations. So if we have that type of solar flare today, how much wiring and motherboards would be subject to complete 
destruction. So what do we need to do about that? In fact, when we were at the um, Republican Convention, we were trying to make that an executive order of the governor to make securing our supply of electricity a national security primary objective. They can do this pretty economically with Faraday cages over the uh, equipment, search protectors, and shunts. So I would encourage you to contact your representative and go, look, do what it takes to secure the Texas supply. When you start looking at the um, uh, energy supply, you have grids. You have an east grid, west grid, and Texas has its own grid of ERCOT. Our stance was keep Texas independent as a backup system. Secure our equipment. So in the event of a catastrophic event, Texas is protected. If we secure Texas, we can be the avenue to restore the rest of the nation. So. This is very important. I hope you speak with your representatives about it. Okay, I'm going to try to zip through this and kind of uh, wind this up. Dirty electricity. We talked about the static that's being emitted, that's picked up. Uh, how many here remember when you would turn on a vacuum cleaner and your TV got staticky? Those are static and disharmonics in your electrical system. Well, now the um, TVs have harmonizing and there's in them to take out that static, but that still exists. That static creates electromagnetic frequencies can, that can disrupt your own biological function. Here's an example of a clean waveform of circuit, and this is an example of what electricians refer to as noise, and I call it static, because I think everybody can kind of relate to the static online. Uh, this is a letter from an individual that uh, <coughs> shortly after her smart reader was installed, she had to replace the motherboard on her uh, ice maker and her Thermador oven cost her $1,400. <clears throat> what you're hearing from the field is because they are using non-licensed electricians. In fact, many of these installers are paid by how many they can get done a day. So what happens is if you've had an analog meter on this house for 30 or 40 years, it kind of gets tight. So in order for them to get it out, they'll kind of jar it. A meter base is kind of like a plug. And the meter is, no, well, it's like a socket. The meter base is like a socket, and the meter is like a plug. So when they jinky it to get the old one out, if it creates a gap, or if that base doesn't suck up really tight, it creates an arcing that can create heat and cause fires. And there have been numerous fires that have been reported. In fact, one manufacturer is called Census. There have been 70,000 recalled in Portland uh, the same day that the city of Brady in that it does 2.5 million for census meters, the same day, the state of Pennsylvania removed 100, and our said 190,000, but 186,000 meters siding, overheating, and uh, fire problems. And then Saskatchewan is removing 100,000, and census is actually kind of coughing up some money to compensate for what's happening there. Now, census meters own their own frequency with the FCC, so they are able to transmit with two watts of power. Yay! So in Brady, where there were 3,000 homes with three meters apiece, that is 9,000 residents. So when those transmit their data, 9,000 times two watts of energy is 18,000 watts of energy in our community that didn't exist before they deployed this technology. But, now, all we have to do is go look to the FCC, who is the regulatory agency, who is supposed to be overseeing the safety standards of this technology. So here we have uh, the FCC chairman that was appointed by Clinton to the committee and then as the chairman uh, by Bush. Kevin Powell, who happens to be the son of Colin Powell. He is now the current president of the lobbyist group of National Cable and Telecommunications Association. Right? He's the president now. He used to be the chairman. Who do we have now? We have Thomas Wheeler, who is now the chairman of FCC, who used to be the president of the National Cable and Telecommunication Association, and he's also the CEO of Standard Telecommunication and Internet Association. So that's what they call a revolving door. Now, just since I've been watching, which is about two years, here's some things coming out of the FCC. How many extremities were we all taught we have? 
hands, feet, right four? No, no. Now we have six because the FCC has reclassified our ear as an extremity. So the standards for RF that were acceptable at an arm's length are now acceptable at your ear extremity. Now these frequencies are very sensitive to distance from the subject. But n never fear, you now have six extremities. <clears throat> there is legislation all around at various state and uh, federal levels trying to abolish landlines. That is your landline home phone. Everyone has got to wake up and start paying attention here because they are trying to, they're saying it's cost effective and we don't need all this wire. Well, other countries are, are deploying fiber optics. So we believe the answer to a lot of this problem is to invest in fiber optics. Oh, distributed antenna systems. This came out about three weeks ago and I was sick. Normally, when sailor towers are put in, they have to go through a permitting process and are subject to zoning codes of the community, but not now. With this legislation, it has it that uh, now any co-location of new systems on towers or buildings uh, excludes, excuse me, this ruling now excludes co-locations of new systems on towers and buildings from further local review. So we don't need any of that nasty old zoning board review on where to put our antennas anymore. That means wherever towers or roof mounted antennas already exist, anything can pile on another additional state or local control. Add this to the fact that no one monitors the compliance with FCC standards, the problem is obvious. So now anywhere there's an antenna, now they can just go pack them in. So start paying attention to your high rise buildings. And I would advise if you're doing any traveling and staying at a hotel, do not pick the upper floors of the hotels. Start looking around for antennas. The FCC utilized what is called a specific absorption rate when determining the safety of all this wireless technology. They utilize a mannequin head. It's called SAM. It's an acronym. That mannequin head is modeled after a six foot two military male skull and it is filled with a goo that's supposed to emulate your brain. And at the top of the mannequin head is the thermo a thermometer. So what they do is they position the wireless device from the mannequin head to determine at what distance after being off for 30 minutes to keep that thermometer from heating up one degree. So whatever that distance is from the mannequin head, not heating it up one degree is what's deemed as safe. So if this wireless technology doesn't sizzle you like bacon, to where you are heated, you're experiencing heat or shock, it's safe. They are not testing the effects of these frequencies on living organisms. To the FCC, you're nothing more than a piece of meat. That's how you cook meat. Well, rare, be well. Excuse me, Mr. Wheeler, I am not a dummy. As a living organism, my body has electrical function. Animals, plants, insects are living entities and these frequencies have impact. It is time that the FCC possibly relinquishes this role over to an entity, maybe perhaps the EPA or FDA, that will look at the biological research and act to give us safe standards from this technology that is in our public schools, our hospitals, our government buildings, and deployed recklessly, which is basically putting any person in this community in public endangerment, which is a felony. When I looked it up in Wikipedia, public endangerment. So yes, we have issues. This is a report that correlated, uh, it's about a 1,200-page report, I believe. It's called the Bioinitiative Report. This is a summary of it, and at the bottom of the screen are 67 different studies. Each dot represents a biological effect observed in this report. Now at the top of here, what we have, at the top of here in the blue line, we have where the FCC level says is safe. Here's where the FCC says it's safe, and here are all the biological effects observed 
in thousands of studies, but this one's just a chart of the 67 down here. This report is done by 29 MDs, MDs PhDs, electrical engineers, etc., from 10 different countries. These symptoms of the red dots represent sleeplessness, cancers, um, many different biological effects. One in particular, this is one I like to cite, is diabetes and electrosensitivity. You know, don't you think we should figure out we have a problem when we start seeing dialysis clinics popping up on the corners of our walks in our communities? Start watching how many um, dialysis clinics there are. Or how about infertility clinics? I just beg people to start <coughs> looking. And possibly, I'm not saying all diabetes is from this, but it could be. And if you'll watch this video, it will have case studies where individuals would check their blood sugar, go out for a 20 minute walk, come back and the blood sugar would drop. When that same person would walk an electric treadmill that had an electromagnetic field around it, so you're getting the same amount of exercise, each day the blood sugar went up. This person is sensitive to electromagnetic fields. How many here have heard of someone a friend or someone close to a friend who's been diagnosed with a brain tumor, a glioma. Okay, hang on, hold those up please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, I don't know how many people are in this room. Uh, glioma, blastoma multiform, GBMs. Uh, there is significant research that shows that that particular type of brain cancer has a direct correlation to ARF exposure. Now what's encouraging is asbestos, DDT, do you think it went away because the government took care of that problem for you? Or tobacco, did the government take care of that for you? No, what took care of it? Injured people filing suit in courts. So do I think that the radio frequencies are going to be uh, taking care of us by our government? I don't think so. I think it's going to have to come after years of injury of individuals, and that's what's happening. There are 29 different brain cancer cases that are taking place in the courts in New York right now. <coughs> what has been an obstacle is they have the law, the, the court systems have what is called a dog or fry test, which means if you have an expert who's going to be making expert testimony on science, that the science should be deemed what is called generally accepted. So because the FCC has been the authority on radio frequencies, the generally accepted science has been the specific sorption rate or the mannequin head. So if it was something besides thermal impact or heating up the thermometer, it was not considered generally accepted. Except about, I think it's in September, the judge said that the FCC may be sovereign over regulatory issues, but they are not sovereign over scientific truth. So these cases are going to be able to use experts testifying on biological effects, I believe for the first time. Now, the other twist to that is that all these brain cancer cases had to occur before 1996. Because in 1996 they did the Telecommunication Act, which basically has in section 704 that says that a municipality cannot, not, cannot object to the locale of a cellular tower due to environmental effects. So they excluded the location of towers from the control of municipalities. Uh, this is uh, received, this research comes from Dr. Martin Paul. It won the 2013 Global Medical Research Report and I'm excited about this report. This report shows the effects of radio frequencies at the cellular levels of what are called voltage-gated calcium channels. So your heart has a lot of these voltage-gated calcium channels as well as other different types of uh, organs and, and glands. Some of you may be, have heard of medication of beta blockers. You may have heard of beta blockers. Okay, those block the calcium channels to inhibit how much calcium is going into that cell. RF frequencies have the capacity to influence how much calcium is getting into the cell. Now, there are electromagnetic frequency devices that are beneficial, and then there are some that are hazardous. This technology 
or this research demonstrates how that happens. Here's a quick chart that the dark lines in blue show the rate of increase of electromagnetic fields. This is a rate of increase of autism. And the light field here is the rate of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is now the third leading cause of death. Uh, in 1975, um, it was one in, well, in 2001, it's one in 250. And it doubled between 2009 from 110 to 2013. So in four years, the rate of autism doubled. There are numerous reports available, and I am going to stop here. And I want to quickly go over what possibly you can do in your community. There is a law that's a state law that is called Texas Local Government Code 9.004. This is what we utilized in the city of Brady. By petition, we went and changed our city charter to include a utility, utility customer rights. The utility customer of the city has the right to decline installation, the right to request removal of any product or service of the city or any product or service provided to the city by a third party, which the customer deems harmful to their person, property, or privacy. The city shall notify customers of this right as a notice on the all utility bills submitted to the customers. Customers have the right to refuse installation or request removal of any product or service at any time by submitting a written request to the city secretary. Upon receipt of the notification, the city shall comply with the customer's request to decline installation or request removal for a product or service within 30 days. The city shall restore all previously provided utilities at no cost to the customer. The city shall not impose a penalty or a surcharge to customers who decline installation or request removal of any product or service. The city is civilly liable to the customer for personal injury, property damage, or death during the time the customer was subject to the product or service. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was average. Brady only has 5,000, so in, in order to utilize this law, here it is in Texas Local Government Code 904. Uh, so it's 5% of registered voter or 20,000 signatures. Okay? Here's the deal in order to change your city charter, it can only be done once every two years. You have amendments coming up on your May ballot. May of 2015, which means if you don't hit that ballot in 2015, you can't do this for two more years. Now, in order to do this, you need, for San Antonio, City of San Antonio, you need 20,000 signatures done, I would recommend, by the end of January. Now, before you roll your eyes, let's think about this a little bit. We only need 100 people who says, I can go get 30 signatures a day for eight days. 100 people getting 240 signatures. That is tw uh, 24,000 signatures because you need an extra. Now, tell me, what, 1.5 million people? Are you telling me we can't get 100 people that says, I know 240 people that would sign this? I mean, what do you think? What do you think, huh? Double. Okay, come on here. What do you think? No, come on. Whatever it is. Yay, nay. Yay. Yeah. You know, it's doable. Now, whether you want that wording or other people, I would recommend that you visit some of these websites that you have here of Smart Meter, uh, San Antonio Smart Meter Awareness.org, Coalition for Safe Meters. I will help you. I'll come. And actually, it was really quite fun. You got to know your neighbors. You had something to talk about. You hand them a flyer. You, you tell them a little bit about it. And people readily signed it. It was really pretty easy. How many here have done petitions before? OK? So I recommend that you get in touch with Sandy or Jeannie or Chris uh, and see what, I mean, it's going to have to be pretty fast, but 100 people getting 30 signatures in eight days. What's really handy is if you designate a location and say, drive by wherever, there'll be a table there, and have them come to you. That's really pretty good. 
So if you're interested in that, I would like to take, whoop, I'm just right on the dot. I will take questions. May I ask a question? Yes, sir. I live in a condominium. I have six of these meters on my bedroom wall. CPS graciously mm -hmm. said I could opt out. Okay. What I that won't do me any good with five remaining. What can I put in the walls or is there any lining you can put in to stop the radiation? There are shielding materials. Um, yeah. the best ones regarding a fabric type material is called Swiss Shield. And they're kind of Swiss it. Swiss Shield. Um if you'll visit and email me, my website is helpyourselfwellness.com. Uh, I'm actually putting together an order for shielding fabric um, to go like over your bed and in your area. Um, there are meters, filters, that you can plug into your electrical system that take out that uh, static. And what's interesting is when you take the static out, remember how they could tell what was happening because of the static? These filters harmonize it and remove that static. So all they get back is this clean wave, so they can't really tell what was going on in your home due to the static. So those filters, as they're removing that dirt electricity that causes heat, that causes your appliances to heat up, that costs you electricity. So in instances, these can also help reduce your electrical bill, take out that static in your electrical system that can come into your body and cause you issues. Yes, ma'am. I have something on that shield because they've already been through my neighborhood and I've already opted out and I already have the alternate one. Yes, Here's a so business card. I've been into a lot of conversations. Here's a business card. Uh -huh. And they still, she was uh, quite, uh, quite freely told me different things that you could put on the inside of your walls and where you could get it that, 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 to block any radiation that may be there. And so they were pretty open about that, telling you about that. The biggest I have a question about that the other meter, because it was either that or have no electricity. So I had to go to the other meter and pay the digital meter, the, the, the opt out. Yeah, the opt out. It's still a digital meter. <coughs> Remember that chart that showed digital pulsing? So it's still good at what it radiates the same amount. It will create the static in your line. It is not transmitting through the cellular communication. So it's not quite as um, generating as much static in your line, but it still does. I would, I would force, I mean, I'm telling you, I want to analog. I mean, you know, here's the thing. Isn't the city supposed to be for the people? And, you know, I've kind of got this feeling that they've almost turned into what is actually a correct term of a parasite. Because a parasite lives off the host. And if that goes for a certain extended period of time, the host dies. Well, as our taxes go up and up, and we get more and more in debt, the last I checked, there was over $294 million in million? Billion? Billion. It had to be billion. Dollars of debt, of municipal debt in the state of Texas, making us second to New York. So, you know, we have issues. So I thank you for coming here tonight. One more question? No, I'm just going to clarify. The way I understand it, the smart meters have two antennas that uh, pulse all the time, right? That is, I'm sorry. Actually, I believe they can have three. You have one that transmits 900, I think it's 902 is what um, Silver Spring said, that transmit to the utility company. Then you have a 2.4 gig that is the Zigbee chip that communicates with the smart meters, and I believe smart mesh appliances. networks, or smart appliances, have a third okay. that communicate between the homes. Okay, that's even worse. Yeah. But, 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 and then the step down that they say you can opt out of the smart meters, the digital, and it has one antenna. It's not, it's not analog. Right. You want to not get either digital or smart. You want to keep... You yeah, are they... Are they, they, want to make you think, they want to make you think you're opting out of uh, smart meters and digital. Now, are they opting no, out of that? No, they don't say it. No, they didn't say you're opting out of digital. They so, said it's going to be digital also. So are they proposing so the drop on the but digital? They're, they're taking that Was it OMR? OMR. So yeah. And you know, here's the thing. Even with your...
cordless home phones. Here's some things you can do in your home. These devices take this meter off the chart. Six, I mean, I can walk into a home, and we do home remediation. We come in your home, we check and say, yep, that cordless home phone, right by your head, you probably had one since 1980. But remember those had a long antenna on them? And I think they were analog. So they were a little smoother in there. I'm not sure about that one. Get a landline. Get a corded phone where you can tell that you're getting a phone call. If you need your cordless phone, plug it in, use it, come back and unplug the thing. Unplug the handhelds because they're, they're chatter. They're sitting there pulsing going, don't forget me, I'm a handheld, I'm not the base unit, don't forget me base unit, I'm over here, I'm over here, I'm over here. So then you've also got your Wi-Fi. We have Wi-Fi in our home, but we manage it. We uh, hardwire through Ethernet all of our computers. In the event we need Wi-Fi, we turn it on, but you have to contact your ISP provider and get the login and password, or I do for Verizon, and I think at and is the same way, where you physically have to log in with a login and password to enable and disable the Wi-Fi on the device. That's right here. They don't have a button. Some of them have a button. Mine didn't have a button. Well, that's just the link system. You can manage it yourself. Uh, mine can't. Not for my Verizon. That's how I have to manage my Verizon router. Now, let's see. What else do you have? How far does that radiate from the Wi-Fi? Uh, it, you know, I can't even test in here because there's so much... Probably my wireless microphone. If this is a room you never go in, is that a problem? I would turn it off. At a minimum, turn it off at night. At a minimum. Now, you're, um, when I got my meter, I started sitting around my office, and I was sitting there getting fried. Each one of your laptops has an airplane mode that turns off that Wi-Fi search. So to really get clean in your home, you've got to turn off the, the Wi-Fi on your router. You have to turn off the Wi-Fi off of every electrical uh, wireless device. You have to put on my airplane mode. Uh, you have uh, smart TVs. I think you're sunk. I don't know about that one. I haven't researched it. Does anyone know if you can turn off the Wi-Fi feature of smart TVs? Okay, good to know. On smart TVs, uh, he's saying that there is a switch. So if you do get whatever you're purchasing, I would look at that and say, how do I turn off this Wi-Fi? Turn the airplane mode on your phone. Turn the airplane mode on your phone. And don't charge, don't phone charge it year. in your bedroom. Because the intensity of the frequencies are very intense when you have a low charge on your cell phone and you're charging it. Also, when you're using it out and about, if you got one bar, it takes extra power to try to reach an antenna. So when you have one bar, uh, <laughs> Try not to make the phone calls, but when you do use your cell phone, use your speaker and try to keep it away from your body. Uh, I carry my cell phone in a purse so that I'm not sticking it in my pocket. Uh, it's the youth. We have not seen children who've been raised in this environment go through maturity yet. So I have, in fact, it took me six months to be able to talk about this without crying. So I was the crying witness at Citizen Comments for six months because I was so torn up by knowing what this technology is doing to us. Yes, sir. Has anyone seen the video where they have five kids sitting in a room taking their cell phones? Oh, and the popcorn? Put them in, putting them together, transmitting with them in the popcorn box. Now, I have been told... That'll, that'll tell you. Now, I have been told that that was not accurate. I do not know for a fact. I would encourage somebody to try it. I will tell you that my old Blackberry Pearl that I had since 2008 was blasting me. And that's how come I finally upgraded to the i phone. Uh, because it's uh, Samsung's. But these meters, uh, you can get one for like 135 This one's a little uh, higher. It's uh, uh, about $400. We also have a Grand Stetzer filter that you plug in so that we know where to place these filters to help lower that. There's things you can do. I really am pleased with the static filters that we're now offering uh, because it only takes two for a home and it can result in a payback of lower utilities. So there are things you can do. Um, I appreciate your time. I know I've just been this for an hour and a half. Are there any more questions before we dismiss? Yes, okay, okay. okay.